Colossians chapter 4, beginning in verse 7, Paul says, As to all my affairs, Tychicus, our beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow bondservant in the Lord, will bring you information. For I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of your number, they'll inform you about the whole situation here. Remember, Paul's in Rome. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you his greetings. Also Barnabas' cousin Mark, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. Also Jesus, who is called Justice. These are the only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are from the circumcision, they're Jews. And they've proved to be an encouragement to me. Epaphras, who's also one of your number, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, he sends you his greetings, always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers, that you may stand perfect, fully assured in all the will of God. For I testify for him that he has a deep concern for you and for all those in Laodicea and Herapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, sends you his greetings and also Demas. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and Nympha and the church that's in her house. When this letter is read among you, have it also read to the church of the Laodiceans. And you, for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. Say to Archippus, take heed to your ministry, which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my imprisonment. Grace be with you. Let's pray. Lord, that's what we want today. We need grace. I need grace. I need mercy, Lord. And that we not only would be the, the vessels that you pour your grace and your love and your forgiveness into, but that we could be a channel. Even as Paul is praying for the Colossians, that grace would not just come to them, but it would be with them, Lord. Would you teach us? more today about how that can be true now, right now, right here, in this building, this week. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Colossians is about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Uh, four chapters, if you've been with us, you have heard me talk about it. Might have forgotten what I said, but I'll remind you. Uh, the first two chapters of Colossians are about the person of Christ. Really, you could say chapters 1 and 2 are who Christ is. Chapters 3 and 4 are more about how Christ lives in us and through us. Um, we're talking about how, if you're a Christian, this is what Paul is saying. First of all, he talks about who Christ is, and then he says, well, now that you've received him, back in chapter 2, he's kind of already introduced this in verse 6, he says, as you have received Christ. Now, it's assumed here that we're talking to Christians because people who have received Christ are Christians. People who have not received Christ are not Christians. I can't say that enough. Why? Because it was that very truth that brought me to the Lord. I was a Christian and went to church, but I had never received Christ. And when somebody said, hey, have you ever received Christ? I thought, oh, I don't know what that means. And I was honest enough to admit I hadn't done it. And I would challenge you today, if nothing else, you don't hear me you don't understand, you don't care about anything else I say, know this, that if you have not received the Lord personally, everything I'm going to say will be for no value to you until you have. This is written to Christians. And so Paul says, as you have received Christ, so walk ye in him. In other words, let his life be lived out through you. So we've studied about how if Christ is in my life, it'll affect my marriage. It does affect my marriage. How it'll affect my parenting. Oh, man. I, I can't imagine how worse of a parent I'd be without the Lord. I'm not a great parent with the Lord, but I, I would be worse. How I would be as an employee or an employer. Very practical stuff. If Jesus is in your life, and then in chapter 4, we come to the subject of our words. Remember Paul starts in chapter 4, verse 2, and he says, Devote yourselves to prayer. If we are going to have Christ living in us, and he's filling our lives out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth, speaks. And so the living word, Christ, who comes to live inside you, now wants to minister through your words. And the first area we looked at was the power of prayer. 
most powerful words you and I can ever speak on this planet will probably be prayer to God, right? Secondly, words are ministered in terms of the proclamation of the gospel. That was the second thing we talked about. Remember, make the most of the opportunity, give grace to the hearers, redeem the time. That's what we studied last week. Now we come to the close of the book. And frankly, we realize that this is one of these chapters a lot of people kind of skip. And maybe you wonder, why are passages like this even in the Bible? Verses with people's names that I cannot read. I don't know who they are. Frankly, I don't care who they are. Maybe that's a confession. Wednesday nights, we've been going through the book of Genesis. We did Genesis 10, the table of the nations. Well, that was a hard chapter. So-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so, so-and-so was a so-and-so. And you just kind of go through and you're saying, I'm not really sure what all this is about. But then in chapter 11, you, oh gosh, I'm glad we're done with chapter 10. And another genealogy. And there's more to come. But let me encourage you, because as a pastor, it's my job and I love it. But for many people, they skip over passages of scripture like this. Like, you know, this is just his closing remarks. He's signing off and he's saying hello it didn't have to be in your Bible. <laughs> the Holy Spirit inspired that. By the way, do you know the book of Philemon? A lot of Christians never read it. You should. Philemon, one chapter. It's a personal letter to one guy, but it's in your Bible. If it's in your Bible, there is truth there that will change your life. Go by faith when you read any portion of the Bible, especially the parts you go, I don't really know why it's here. It doesn't really do much for me. God didn't go, oh, okay, next time I'll leave it out. It's, there's no filler in the Bible. All scripture is inspired by God. Now, as Paul talks about his companions, we have to admit, kind of get a different view of what's going on in prison. Most of us picture Paul just alone in the prison, chained to some guards. Don't think so. He's going to talk about eight guys who are with him. Sounds like he's got a party going on over there. If you ask me, he's got all these other people who are greeting people. He seems to be well surrounded. You see, Paul had to learn a lesson just like all of us need to learn, if God's going to use us in this world, he's not going to use us alone. Think of Moses in the Old Testament. Now, there's a guy we'd all agree God used Moses, right? I don't have to argue that. Big time, no one's like Mo. I mean, he's met with God alone. Uh, God wrote with his finger on the stones and gave it to Moses, communed with Moses for 40. Amazing. And Moses led the children of Israel, you know this, out of Egypt through the promised land. And uh, or, or through the wilderness, but not quite into the promised land because of his sin. But Moses was a man uniquely used by God. But as you read in the Old Testament during the wilderness wanderings, for instance, in the book of Exodus, chapter 17, you remember the Amalekites? They came out to fight against the Israelites. And God told Moses, go up on the mountain, station yourself up there and pray for the battle. And Moses said, I'll pray. Joshua, you go fight. And Joshua took the soldiers, the men. They went down to battle in the valley. You remember what happens? As Moses lifts his hands in prayer, that's the position of prayer, by the way. We always think, oh, close your eyes. No, that's not biblical. Raising your hands in prayer was the way a Jew would pray. And as Moses lifted up his hands to pray, to intercede for the battle, the tide of battle started changing and the Israelites started winning. And then when Moses got tired of praying, he, his arms would start to droop and the Tide of battle would go the other way. I've always said if I was in that battle and I knew that was going on, I'd, before I go engage the enemy, I'd be, how you doing up there, Mo? You know, are your hands lifted or are they drooping down? Because I don't exactly want to die right now. But to remember the story, because it teaches us some incredible principles. The battles have to be fought in the valley, but they're decided who's going to win on the mountain. That's true for me and you too, by the way. Who's praying for you? But besides that, remember, even Moses cannot sustain himself up there, so God brings him two men. Remember who they were? Aaron and her, her who's a him. Yeah, a guy named her, but it's a man. And they come and they support his arms. They get him up in the air, literally, physically. And as long as they can keep his arms up, the battle goes to the Israelites. And at the end of the day, they prevail. The lesson is this. Moses is a man unique in his relationship to God. He spends time alone with God, but he cannot do what God has called him to do successfully alone. And neither can you. Neither could Paul. And Moses would learn this lesson more than once. Uh, there's an occasion where Moses gets so despondent in his ministry, he says, kill me. Now, that's not a good day when you're saying that to God, right? You're in the center of God's will, and you're going, just take me out. Elijah had a day like that. There were others. Jonah said it. In fact, he said, throw me overboard. I'm ready to go. 
And God ministers to Moses. He doesn't kill him, thankfully. But he does tell him what to do. Jot it down if you're taking notes. Numbers 11, verses 16 and 17. When Moses was at the end of his rope, <laughs> here's what God said. Gather for me 70 men from the elders of Israel, whom you know to be elders of the people and their officers. Bring them to the tent of meeting and let them take their stand there with you. Then I'll come down. I'll speak with you there. Look at this. I'll take of the spirit that's on you. I'll put it on them and they shall bear the burden of the people with you so that you will not bear it all alone. Moses learned this lesson again and again. You can't do it alone, Moses. As gifted as you are, as unique as you are, I won't let you do it alone. You're going to need others. And Paul certainly learned this lesson. If this passage teaches us anything, it's the title. With a little help from my friends, I'll be able to do what God's called me to do. So put this down. We see in verses 7 through 14, there are lessons from the pen. And I want you to put in the word character. There are some profiles in character here. We are going to speed preach through these, meaning I'm going to give you the fill-ins so that you don't have to leave with one that's blank, so you'll have to listen quickly. First of all, we have Tychicus, a man who most Christians have never even heard his name once, but he's mentioned five times in the New Testament. He's a man, put it down, with a servant's heart. With a servant's heart. He's the one who's going to carry the epistle of Colossians to Colossae. He's going to also bring the letter of the Ephesians of the Ephesians, to the Ephesians with him, and the letter of Philemon. He is a messenger. He is somebody who has been part of Paul's ministry team since Acts 20, when Paul was going to Jerusalem with the, uh, the offering for the poor saints of Jerusalem. He's with him all along, but then later on in ministry, we see that Paul is starting to use him, not just as a messenger boy, but actually as a fill-in for the pulpit of Titus and later Timothy. While Paul's in prison, getting ready to die, he says to Tychicus, I want you to go and relieve Timothy so Timothy can come be with me here in prison. And he was willing to go so that somebody else could be where he wanted to be, which was at Paul's side. Uh, Onesimus, he's a man with a sinful past. If you don't know his name, don't know anything about him, read the book of Philemon and you'll discover what we get to know about him. He's one of Paul's companions here. But what's interesting about this is he's actually from Colossae. He was a slave. He wasn't a Christian. But his boss, his master, Philemon, oh, he was a Christian, and he ran away, this Onesimus, from being a slave. And he runs and he somehow comes to Rome, meets Paul, gets saved. And in Philemon, Paul is sending Onesimus back to Colossae, back to his master Philemon. And he says to Philemon, whom Paul knows, hey, don't receive him back as a slave. Receive him back as a brother. He's a beloved brother. In fact, he says, if you want to really bless me, send him back because he's ministering to me. Then there's Aristarchus. Put this down. He's a man with a sympathetic heart. A sympathetic heart. He's called my fellow prisoner. Paul's, if you just read it, you think, oh, he must be in jail with Paul. No, he's in jail, not in custody. He's made himself a prisoner. Wherever Paul's in prison, Aristarchus shows up as though he's in prison just to minister to Paul. Then there's Mark. Put in the word surprising, because he is a man with a surprising future. Because we don't know it yet in our text, but we'll find out in history. He's the one who writes the Gospel of Mark, which is probably the observations of the Apostle Peter. Mark is this one who, like a Jonah, is the man that proves God gives second chances, because he's the one, remember, who went with Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary journey and didn't like it and went home. He bailed. And so when it came to the second missionary journey, Barnabas said, let's take Mark. And Paul said, hey, uh, no way, Yahweh. Okay, he didn't say it quite like that, but he's not going to happen on my watch. He's not trustworthy. So Paul goes one way, and Barnabas takes John Mark the other way. And he, so Mark has blown it. But by the end of Paul's life, Paul values him, wants him, and he's now ministering to Paul. Justice, a man with a strong commitment. Justice, his name was Jesus. That would have been a hard name to have as a Christian. Uh, I don't think they called him Jesus. Uh, but his Latin name, is, his surname was Justice, which means righteous. And evidently he lived up to it. He was a Jew. He was one of the few Jews for Jesus, <laughs> the original Jews for Jesus, that was with Paul there in prison. Which meant he had left his people and was traveling with Paul and had given up his entire 
past background so he could stand with Paul uh, no matter what Paul would go through. Then there's Epaphras. Put this down. He's a man with a single passion. Epaphras was from Colossae. He was the pastor of the church. He's the one who had come with the concerns about the church to Paul there in prison. We find out something about Epaphras. He was dedicated to prayer. Paul says, he's, I just want you guys to know. He's telling Paul's, Paul is telling Epaphras' church some things about their pastor that maybe they did, maybe they didn't. He doesn't stop praying for you guys. He just has one passion in prayer. That's all he wants is that you guys would be mature. And by the way, he's concerned for the other Christians in the neighborhood as well. And then there's Luke. You know who he is. He wrote the book of Acts and the gospel of Luke. Put this down. He's a man with a special talent because here we're reminded he's a physician. It's Dr. Luke. Here's Paul. He's a faith healer. I mean, Paul did incredible miracles. Probably nobody else other than Jesus did the kind of miracles that Paul did. They would take work handkerchiefs, sweatbands from Paul, and they would take them out to sick people and people would get well. Paul raised the dead, and yet he travels with a doctor, and he calls him a doctor. Luke wasn't just smart. He's a very intelligent, probably the best Greek in the New Testament, written by Luke, by the way, and the book of Hebrews. But interesting that Paul traveled with a doctor, and it would remind us of this. As Christians, we trust the Lord for healing. We pray for healing, but God uses doctors. Don't ever think somebody's being spiritual when they refuse to go to a doctor. Paul traveled with one. And then finally we come to Demas. Put this down. He's a man with a sad future. A sad future. He's the last man in this group photo that Paul takes and encloses in the letter. He mentions him just by name. We're not given any more biographical information about Demas here. But knowing the rest of the Bible, we do know more about him. He's kind of the one fly in the ointment uh, because you see in Paul's second imprisonment in Rome, let's understand this, he was in prison in Caesarea for two years. He appeals to Caesar. He is sent to Rome. Most of that's covered in the book of Acts. Paul always wanted to preach in Rome, the headquarters or the capital of the empire. He got to go, but not as a missionary, as a prisoner. All expenses paid <laughs> by the government. And he's in prison now, awaiting his trial. He doesn't know how it's going to turn out. We know he's released. But there's a second imprisonment that will lead to his death. And right before he dies, he writes 2 Timothy. That's where he says, I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I'm ready to be poured out as a drink offering. And he's writing to Timothy, who's the pastor of Ephesus, the church there. And he's describing his conditions. And he says something about Demas. Jot it down. 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 9. He's writing to Timothy. He wants him to come. Make every effort to come to me soon. For Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Thessalonica is where Demas was from. So having put those fill-ins, now let's draw some truths for ourselves about God using us and allowing people to be used in our life. First of all, if God is going to use you, you need to be, put it down, trustworthy. You have to be trustworthy. Jesus had his Judas. Paul had his Demas. And that was a heartbreak for Paul. Demas is unlike the other seven before him. At this time, though, he's just one of the gang. He's just one that's there, a fellow worker, Paul calls him in Philemon. You know, uh, for about a week or so, I've had some horrific pain in one of my molars. I, I don't love dentists. I love the dentists who go to our church. If you're a dentist, please don't get this. I'm sure you're the best. None of your patients ever have any pain because you don't use drills. You use magic to get their teeth clean. Anyway, or, or fixed. Uh, but I, I have some pain in my mouth, and I don't know that it's going to go away on its own. And uh, I, I have TMJ, which is a condition. When I go under any kind of dental work, I get this incredible migraine headache that sets up, and I can hardly be there anyway. But uh, uh, So I've had that going on this week. And then my wife, Becky, went to Israel, and uh, she came back on Monday. And so I was encouraged to take her some flowers, which I thought was a great idea to meet her, surprise her at the airport. She was supposed to get a ride home. So I went and got 24 roses and... Uh, I bought them over at Costco, still got to get a good deal. And, uh, <laughs> and so, you know, I, it was Monday, I don't know if you remember, it was like 180 degrees outside. Yeah. 
And so I wanted to get to the LAX, you know, early enough to make sure I was there before her plane uh, got there so I could surprise her. And, and I realized these, this is going to be all wilty little flowers by the time I get there. It's just way, way, way too hot outside. So I decided to stop at this little shell station across the street. They're going to the little mini mart and get a, a, a free cup of water to put my roses in, you know. So I got some water and I shoved them in there. And, and uh, I was, so I had the roses and I had my cell phone to see what time it was and the best way to get to LAX, you know, with the traffic. And I was walking out and there's this little tiny step. Uh, I, uh, curb. I, it, it, is, it is a curb wannabe. Uh, it's not big enough to be a full-fledged curb. It's just there to hurt you. Anyway, as I, as I came out, I was looking at the, you know, I wasn't looking. And my right ankle gave out as I came off the curb. And, and here, my tooth is killing me already. And now I hit the ground and I jammed one of my fingers really bad. And now my ankle is killing me. And I'm going, man, I'm, from head to toe, I'm a mess. I can't wait to see... Becky, you know, and uh, you're saying, Bob, what does that have to do with any of this? Proverbs 25, 19. That's what it has. Jot it down. Proverbs. Like a bad tooth and an unsteady foot. This is my verse for the week. Is confidence. And a husband. No, I'm just kidding. And a demas. And a faithless man in a time of trouble. It's not required. Paul talks about what does it take to be used of God. And the word that he uses is steward. He considers himself a steward. You know what a steward is? A steward is somebody who has been given something that's not their own and they're responsible for it. And accountable. Somebody says, hey, will you watch my house? Will, I'm, will you feed my dog? Will you water my plants? They don't want to come back and the dog is dead and the plants are over, you know. Oh, I'm sorry, I was busy. Uh, a steward. And here's what Paul says. All of us as Christians were stewards. Meaning, what do you have that you did not receive? In other words, you're a Christian. You've been given gifts. You've been given money. You've been given time. You've been given abilities. All of it is a gift from God. And someday we're going to stand before him and he's going to say, hey, what would you do with what I gave you. But Paul says, it is required of a steward that one be found faithful. Faithful. Trustworthy. In other words, if you want God to give you responsibility, be faithful with what he's already given you. Have you ever noticed in the Bible that, that maturity in the Lord, being fruitful for the Lord, is tied in with these allegories that are agricultural. John 15, Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. You want to bear fruit, which is my life through you? abide in me. It's not really you. It's you letting me live my life through you. But think about it. I mean, plants don't, you know, do something overnight. They just don't grow that way. They grow day after day, month after month, year after year, slowly. Right? I have a tree in my front yard. It just patiently sits there. It never in the middle of the night goes, this is boring. I'm going to go check out my neighbor's yard. <laughs> nope, never does that. It's always just there. Never says anything. Never complains. Psalm 1, be a tree planted by their waters, rooted day after day, month after month, year after year, so that in your season you might be able to bear fruit. And when it's your time to bear fruit, they'll, they'll pick you. <laughs> they'll pick you. They'll say, you're the one we can use, you see. Here's the way God says it in Psalm 37. It's one of my favorite chapters in the Old Testament. Dwell in the land, cultivate faithfulness. Faithfulness, Galatians 5, and 23, is one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit because it's the character of Christ. Read Revelation. He is the faithful and true one. He's a faithful witness of who God is, and he faithfully carried out his ministry. If I'm going to be like Jesus, if you're going to be like Jesus, we're going to be used like Jesus, We've got to be faithful. We've got to be trustworthy. Put this down, number two. Be a servant. Be a servant. Now, that'll never be something that is attractive to your flesh, but it is something that Jesus was. He said, as the Son of Man, even the Son of Man, and I think I've shared this, but if not, remember, we, we make the mistake when we hear the term Son of Man, we think, well, that's about his incarnation. He's the son of God, that's his deity, and he's the son of man. That's about, he's human. It's more than that. The term son of man, your brain, needs to go Old Testament, Daniel 7, where he has a vision that the 
son of man goes up to the ancient of days and receives an eternal kingdom. It's one of the titles of the Messiah. It's not just about his humanity. But he said, even the son of man, Jesus said this, even the son of man, as great as that person is, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Serving, it doesn't really come very natural, it never will, but the Spirit of God is going to fill us, it's going to be our nature. I read an article this last week, it shocked me and it's kind of amazing. In a society where you can order dinner, get a ride, rent out a room in your home, find a parking space and hire someone to walk your dog, did you know they have an app for that by the way? All with the click of a button. Last week, news of a new app spread like wildfire in cities across the United States. A new service called Pooper promises to provide on-demand dog poo pickup with the tap of an app. Some of you are already writing it down right now. <laughs> After paying a small monthly fee ranging from $15 a month for two scoops per day, yeah, to $35 a month for unlimited scoops, Users simply have to snap a picture of their dog's business before walking away, confident in the knowledge that a scooper would be along shortly to pick it up. Tens of thousands of people visited the pooper website within a week. Finally, dog owners could put their dog's poop, quote, this is their tagline, in someone else's hands. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> there was only one problem. It was all just a big joke. Pooper's creators were trying to make a point. Specifically, the increasing reliance on others to do stuff for us that we could easily do for ourselves. The fact that so many people believed in app connecting poopers, dog owners, with scoopers is a testament of how we so desperately want our phones to help us take care of all of life's problems. You don't have to drive yourself these days. You don't have to get your own food. You don't even have to run your own errands or hang your own shelves, said the creator of the fake app. As it continues this way, we're just wondering, where do you draw the line? Where do we as a society even care about drawing the line? And the one who was quoting this article was a Christian, and they said this, it seems any service that makes one's life easier, less messy, or more convenient is met with great enthusiasm these days, and truthfully, what's so wrong with that? Nothing. So long as this consumer mentality doesn't negatively affect our willingness to serve others, and more specifically, so long as we resist the temptation to develop apps to take the place of exercising our spiritual gifts, they wrote. And then they wrote this, I can see it now. Don't have time to deliver a meal to that sick member of your church? Just tap this app and a hot meal is on its way. Don't. It actually already exists. And it does. There's an app just for that so that you don't have to serve anybody. But these guys, Paul calls over and over again, Servants. That's a reflection of Jesus. That's Jesus living in them, living his life out. Put this down, number three, be encouraging. Of course, we all love encouragement, but here Paul describes how he's going to send them. They're going to not only inform everybody as to how he's doing, Onesimus and Tychicus will do that, but also he's going to encourage their hearts. I don't know if you've ever been to the Library of Congress. I highly recommend you go there. It's your, con it's your library, you know. Get a, get, a, get a library card. You have to get one to get in, but you're a citizen of the United States, so stand in line and get one if you're ever there in D.C. But you know the most, uh, uh, in, the, the exhibit that uh, draws the most interest, according to the curators there, happens to be the one that has the contents of Abraham Lincoln's pockets the night he was assassinated. They have that there in the Library of Congress. It was uh, donated by Mary, his daughter, about 70 years after his death. Maybe it was his granddaughter, actually. But in the wallet, there's just some normal stuff. There's a couple pairs of eyeglasses that were in a Lincoln's pocket, a lens polisher, a pocket knife, a linen handkerchief with his name embroidered, a watch fob and a wallet. Interesting, in the wallet, there's one uh, uh, $5 Confederate note inside of his wallet. That's all he had in there. Um, but there were nine newspaper clippings, and that's what I find to be the most interesting. All of them dated about a year, year and a half before when he was running for re-election. One was a well-worn clipping lauding Lincoln's achievements as president and describing him, quote, as one of the greatest statesmen of all time. Isn't it interesting? One of the greatest presidents we've ever had carries around with him 
somebody's article talking about what a great president he was. Can I tell you what that tells me? We all need to be affirmed. We all need encouragement from other people. One, part of, one person put it this way, flatter me and I may not believe you. Criticize me and I may not like you. Ignore me and I may not forgive you, but encourage me and I'll never forget you. And how true that is. Put this down number four, be careful not to get stuck in solitary. We all have to go through trials, but I just want you to notice Paul's not alone. The fact is, when we're going and being used by God, we love being with God's people, most of us. But when we're going through hard times, when we're going through trials, and Paul's got a trial, he doesn't know how it's going to turn out. When you're suffering, when you're worrying, when you're in fear, when you have pain, physical or emotional, we tend to isolate from one another. And maybe you're a person who has never had many friends anyway. And so you're here at church, you're here worshiping the Lord, but you live most of your life very alone. You could be married, you could have a big family, but you live it very alone. I don't know if you've ever heard of Pepper Rogers. He was a coach at UCLA years ago. He said uh, back then, he goes, I was in the middle of a terrible season as football coach at UCLA. It even got so bad that it upset my home life. He said, my dog was my only friend. So I told my wife that a man needs at least two friends. So she bought me another dog. <laughs> Maybe you feel like, yeah, that's about it. I can relate to you, Mr. Rogers. Can I tell you something? God does not intend any one of us in this room to ever walk through our trials alone. No, the Bible says no one else can fully experience what you're going through when you have a joy or a, a loss. It, it, uh, your own heart experiences it uniquely. But God's intention is not that you would go through it alone. We know the Bible says cast our cares on Him. But more than that, He tells us we're to bear one another's burdens. Don't go through it. Some of you right now are alone in some trial. And maybe there's one thing God wants you to take away. It's this today. Jot it down, Proverbs 17, 17. I consider this a promise, by the way. Maybe you need to claim it. A friend loves at all times. Notice this, though. A brother is born for adversity. One translation or it says, in the night of need, a brother is born. We often talk about as Christians, you shouldn't be a Lone Ranger Christian. But think about it. Even Lone Ranger had Tonto. There are people that are more Lone Rangers than the Lone Ranger. You say, oh, who needs friends? Paul did. By the way, Paul mentions over 100 people in the New Testament epistles that were a part of his ministry, a part of his life. 100. That's quite a few. Jesus had friends. He said, oh, Jesus just had followers. I beg to differ. He was called a friend of sinners. By the way, I'm glad he still is one. For one right here. I don't know about you. I'm glad he's a friend of sinners. But he turned to his disciples in John 15, 15, and he said this, No longer do I call you servants. Servant doesn't know what his master's doing. <laughs> but I have called you friends. Because everything the Father has made known to me, I have made known to you. It's obvious Jesus had friends that were his followers. The 70 that he sent out, certainly he knew them well there in Luke 10. We don't know their names. Jesus did. And then, of course, the 12 who were named, who spent three and a half years, day and night with him, they were close to him. And among them, there were even three who we have special relationship with Jesus, Peter, James, and John. And on one occasion, Andrew gets in on it. Intimacy at a deeper level. Lord knows everybody's not going to be the same level of friendship in your life. But there needs to be people who know what's going on in your life and are a part of ministering. You know, I love this passage you're familiar with it. We don't have a slide for it, but you can jot down the verses because it's a great one on the subject. Ecclesiastes 4, verses 9 through 12. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. In other words, there's profit in ministering together. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is none to lift him up. Further, if two lie down, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Not only is there profit, but there's prevention. On your own, you can fall. You can fall away from the Lord, and you can fall into sin, or you can just get cold all by yourself. And then he goes on and he says, and if one can overpower him who's alone, two can resist him. 
It's talking about protection. There's more profit. There's prevention and there's protection. And then there's perseverance. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. <laughs> when the Lord's involved in that relationship, the three of you, hey man, you can make it all the way to the end. Can't be torn apart, you know. And so we're to have those kind of relationships. By the way, if you're here and you're going, well, Bob, I just, I don't really have friends. I've never had friends. I don't know how to make friends. And I make enemies, but I don't know how to make friends. <laughs> then I need to tell you, if you haven't heard, they have discovered, I know you might find this hard to believe, they actually discovered a vitamin essential for improving both the quantity and quality of friendships. Mm. B1. I'll prove it. Proverbs 18, verse 24. A man that has friends must show himself friendly. <laughs> Be one. Okay, you got it. Um, I read this, this last week. This is not from a Christian source, but I thought it was very practical and very helpful. If you struggle with having friends or you want to develop friends, here are some things. There's nowhere on your sheet to jot them down. You can jot them down if you want to. Uh, but some suggestions, seven suggestions. First of all, use people's names. When you meet them, use their names. First of all, it'll help you to remember them. But more than that, um, it's been said the sweetest name in any language is a person's own name. Isn't it interesting when God reveals himself to people in the Bible, how often he acts, he'll say, hey, you. <laughs> you know, when God reveals himself to Moses, he doesn't say, I know that you know that I'm God, so I know everything. He says, Moses, Moses. He says it twice. Sometimes it's helpful just so you can help remember it. I like to say people's names when I meet them because I forget it two seconds after they walk away. I often tell people I get one new name, two or three fall out the back now, you know, but use people's names. That's pretty easy to do. That's a very much an encouragement. You see often, I mean, Saul on the road to Damascus, Saul, Saul. Jesus says, Simon, Simon. After the resurrection, Mary does not know who Jesus is until he says, Mary. Use people's names. It's always an encouragement. Secondly, compliment people. You know the Bible says that Jesus, uh, the common man heard Jesus gladly and that gracious words continuously fell from his lips. Compliment people. I'm not talking about flattering them. Have you ever thought about how wonderful it was to be around Jesus? Remember when Philip wants to introduce his friend Nathaniel to Jesus? Nathaniel does not know who Jesus is. Nathaniel, like any good Jew, is waiting for the Messiah to come. They've been waiting for a long time. And Philip says, we have found him. We found the Messiah. What? Yeah, where, who? Jesus of Nazareth. And it's the word Nazareth that really bugs Nathaniel. Remember what he says? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And then Jesus walks in. And remember what Jesus says of Nathaniel? Can any good thing come out of your mouth? No, he doesn't say that. <laughs> That's what I would have said. <laughs> he says, behold an Israelite indeed in whom there is no guile. What's he saying? You say it the way it is. You don't put on an air. You're truthful. You don't believe a Messiah can come from Nazareth. Well, guess what? God's going to show you some stuff, Nathaniel. I saw you before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree. Well, how do you know me? <laughs> You're blown away by that? <laughs> Wait, there's more. <laughs> you see. But Jesus encouraged people. He would see what he could. That was praiseworthy. Think of that woman, Syrophoenician woman. What does that mean? She is not in Jesus' target, his crosshairs of ministry. I've been sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, not to the Gentiles. You want me to come uh, heal your daughter? Nope, not, he's ignoring her. She persists. And finally, he turns around because the disciples are like, would you just get rid of her? And he's not going to get rid of her. He says, woman, great is your faith. She's a Gentile. Great is your... When's the last time you said to somebody who has less spirituality than you, I'm impressed with your faith, and it was true? How about the Roman centurion, another Gentile, who comes to Jesus and says, come to my home, my servant is ill. And Jesus says, I'll come. He says, you know what, wait a minute. Actually, you just say the word. If you just speak the word, you've got authority. I understand authority. When I tell people to go, it's chop, chop, they go. I don't have to go. You just say the word. I know you have power. And Jesus stopped, and it says he marveled. It really impressed him. And he says, I haven't seen such great faith. No, not in the entire nation of Israel. You think that might have made the guy's day? Besides the fact that he healed the servant. Jesus is constantly saying things that are so super encouraging. And then, number four, be yourself. Be yourself. Don't, don't be phony. Don't 
act like someone who has no faults, no worries, no failures. People want to know you, not some virtual projection, some imaginary you, certainly not a copy of somebody else. You want to be a better friend, help people practically. Just help them. Everybody needs help. I heard of this guy, he was putting up an antenna. This is back in the day when we had antennas on top of our roof, I guess. He had moved into a new neighborhood. He was struggling. He didn't know much about how he was going to secure it to the roof. And a neighbor came over. He hadn't even met the neighbor yet. And the, guy, the neighbor had this big bag of tools, you know, with all the stuff on it. And he got up there and he said, let me give you a hand. And so he was working on it. And, and the new guy who had just moved in said, looking at all those tools, he said, what do you make with those? He goes, mostly friends. <laughs> it's true. Number six, take time to listen. Oh, we all know that's important. We all know how valuable the friends are that we have who are just willing to listen. You ever had a friend who, every time you'd call them about a problem, they've had the same kind of problem, only more, bigger? You know, you tell them, I've been sick lately. Well, I had that. Well, I got, I, you know, I almost died. In fact, I did die twice, and they got me back. It's like they're trying to outdo you with your problems. Like, they don't want to listen to you. They want to take something you're talking about and use it for fodder for their conversation. To, enough about you. Let's talk about me. What do you think about me? Kind of thing. The classic illustration on this in the Bible is when Job went through the worst trials. I mean, so much so he becomes Job, right? Lost his children, lost his wealth, lost his health, lost his wife's whatever. I mean, she wasn't, she wanted him to curse God and die. And he's at the lowest point anybody's ever been. And his friends hear about his loss. And they come for miles because of his loss and his suffering. And the Bible says when they first got there, they, were, he, they could see he was grieving. So they just sat down on the ground for seven days and said nothing and just wept. Can I tell you something? If that had just been the end of what they had done, if that's all they had done, it had been like, yo, go, guys. That was awesome. But they open their mouths and they start giving him advice and counsel and criticism. And most of the book is about that Tell by the end they've got to repent before God. And so often people around us, to be their friend, to be like Jesus, we just need to listen. We just need to care. We don't really need to say much of anything. And then finally, don't brag. <laughs> don't brag. Somebody said arrogance is the ultimate friendship repellent. That's true. This was written by a well-known doctor. And I saw on this hill, since my eyesight so keen, the two biggest fools that have ever been seen. And the fools that I saw were none other than you, who seem to have nothing else better to do than to sit here and argue who's better than who. Okay, it's Dr. Seuss. But still, you get the point that it's a good <laughs> advice. Hey, put this down, letter C. During your trial, see that God can still use you. If we can learn anything from Paul here at the end of the book, it's that he's, gonna, he's facing a trial, but he has, he has words to encourage, words to minister to other people. Think about Jesus on the cross. How much ministry did Jesus do on the cross? Quite a bit. Mother, <laughs> behold your son. This day you'll be with me in paradise. He says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. And even as he breathed his last, the centurion comes to faith. This must certainly be the Son of God. Oh, Jesus is ministering during the worst moment. Don't think, I have so much going on, so many problems. I can't minister to anybody. That's a lie. You might be able to minister far more effectively in your trials. Paul has some things to say at the very end that I want you to notice. First of all, put this one down. Realize that God's church, Christ's church, is bigger than ours. Verse 15, Paul says this, Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea. Now, those are not the Christians that are in Colossae. Laodicea is not 100 miles away, but it's not the church of Colossae. It's a different church, different town. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea, and also Nympha, that's, she has a house church. Greet, greet her. When this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And you, for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. Jot down Luke 9, verses 49 and 50. John answered Jesus and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. And you know what? We tried to prevent him because he does not follow along with us. But Jesus said to him, Oy vey. No, that's what I would say. <laughs> Do not hinder him, for he who is not against you is for you. But isn't that kind of our nature? 
we kind of get into a certain church group and it's like, well, you know, we, the Lord's, he's here and everybody else, well, I don't know. Well, you know, they're a little off here and they do weird stuff there. Christ church is bigger than ours. Paul tells this church, connect with the Laodiceans down the road. They're Christians too. And that house church over there, minister to one another. I think it's so important. Not every connection we have with other Christians is the ecumenical antichrist. You know, there are people that rejected Billy Graham because he would have churches of different denominations represented on his stage when he preached the gospel. Yes, that's the devil. It's like, don't do that to yourself. You know, he doesn't say minister to the Laodiceans as long as they're not part of the global network. No, he doesn't say that. I heard of this woman, she went into the post office to buy 50 stamps and the person, the clerk said, well, you know, how many do you want? She said, I need 50. He said, well, what denominations? She said, really, has it come to that? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, give me six Catholic, 12 Presbyterian, 10 Lutheran, and 22 Baptist. That's what she did. It's like, put this down number two. Remind others not to give up on their ministry. You're going through your trial. But people still need encouragement. Look at verse 17. Say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord that you may fulfill it. You know, they had a, a survey done of about a thousand pastors in Orange County and in Pasadena a few years ago. 71% of them said they were burned out. 57% said they would leave now to do another job, even secular work, if they could make enough money to support themselves. Folks, that's pretty tragic. You don't have to be a pastor to get discouraged in the ministry. Amaziah was a king in the Old Testament, became king at 25, kingdom of Judah. And I, I, I find it very interesting what it says about him, because there are a lot of wicked kings in Israel particularly, and also some in Judah. But it says this about Amaziah. He did right in the sight of the Lord. Now, that's what you want to hear. He did right in the sight of the Lord. <laughs> but there's more. <laughs> but not with a whole heart. And if you read his story, he begins doing the right thing. He starts well. He doesn't end well. And there are many, many Christians who start well, but not all finish well. They don't complete the work. Paul could say at the end of his life, I did. I have finished my course. And here he's saying to Archibus, I know that you've backed away. See, we get discouraged. We do ministry and we don't see any results. Or we get burned out. Or we just get busy. And some of you here have been engaged in serving the Lord and for whatever reasons you've backed away from maybe using your gifts or being available. It says of Abraham in Hebrews, having patiently waited, <laughs> he inherited the promises. Hey, God wants to use you. You know, there's a, some of you know I love the movie Chariots of Fire for a lot of reasons. Becky and I, it was the Movie of the year. It was a Christian story, true story, about two runners in the Olympics back in 1929, I think it was. And one of them was a believer in Jesus Christ, and he makes some decisions to give up the gold medal to honor the Lord because the run is in, in the Olympics is going to be on a Sunday, and he doesn't feel it's right to run on a Sunday. Now, frankly, I'd have no conscience about that at all. I don't think it dishonors God at all. But he did, and you've got to obey your conscience. And so he refuses to run, and his chance of Olympic gold is out the window, but the Lord does an amazing thing, and, and he winds up winning gold in another event. But the other story, the sub-story, is about a different man, a Jewish man named Harold Abrams. Abrams is also very fast, also representing Great Britain, and before the Olympics ever comes, he knows about Eric Little, <laughs> the Scotsman, the flying Scotsman, and he has a race, and Harold Abrams is racing against Eric Little, and Abrams is out in the front, which is what he was hoping. He had been training and training for this, and he's wondering, where is Little? And he looks back to see. And when he looks back to see, guess what? Eric Little flies by him and wins the race. And there's this scene where Harold Abrams is with his girlfriend up in the stands, and he's replaying over and over in slow motion how he loses the race. He's so depressed and despondent. And uh, his girlfriend says, what's wrong? He said, I lost. And she said, well, you know what? You were marvelous. He was just more marvelous, she says. <laughs> he beat you fair and square. I mean, he did beat, beat you. You know, kind of get over it. And he, he has this line in the movie. He says to her, he says, if I can't win, I won't run. 
And she says, if you don't run, you can't win. <laughs> That's true for us. If you stop running the race, you can't win. If you stop using your gifts, you can't glorify God. You need to fulfill your ministry. Some of us in this room, I know many men who have gotten discouraged. They've gotten busy or they didn't feel God was using them the way they thought. And so they gave up. Satan's winning right now. God didn't give you a gift to put it on the shelf or to put yourself on the shelf. Paul says, get back to it. Get back to it. You know that, in my opinion, that's what God says to Elijah. Remember Elijah, Mount Carmel, calls down fire. Amazing, killed the prophets of Baal. That was a good day. <laughs> but within 24 hours, he is depressed as you can get because Jezebel has put a hit out on him and he's going to die. And so he runs. He runs as far away as he can, actually outside of her jurisdiction, <laughs> outside of Israel, sits down in the desert under a juniper tree and says, kill me, you know. Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I need some worms. <laughs> okay. Maybe he didn't say that, but that's what he pretty much feels. And God says, let's talk. Remember what he does? He says, Elijah, get up. We need to talk. Not here. I'll talk to you out at my place. <laughs> Come out to Mount Oreb. That's Mount Sinai. That's where the law was given. And so Elijah makes that journey out there. And God, he's waiting for God to show up, Remember? There's the fire, there's the wind, there's the earthquake, and God's not in any of it, not in the shake and bake. There's a still small voice, and God speaks, and God says, what are you doing here, Elijah? Which is an interesting thing for God to say, because God just told him to go. And Elijah goes into this big spiel. Well, I'm the only one who's really serving you, and everybody else is a flake, but I'm on fire, and that's not fair. And so he gives it all, and then God says, um, what are you doing here, Elijah? Like, oh, and he does it again. And he gives the whole same spiel. And what's interesting to me is at the end of the conversation, God never says anything about, don't worry about Jezebel. I'll wipe her out. I'll put a bubble around you. I'll put angels around you. Nobody will be able to. doesn't even mention Jezebel. You know what he basically, I could just paraphrase God's counsel to a discouraged prophet. It's this, go back to work. Go back being a prophet. There are people to anoint. There's work to be done. He tells them what to do. And I think sometimes the Lord just says, would you go back to being used again? Would you go realize I have work for you? To Maybe things haven't worked out the way you expected and the way you thought they should. But you're right now in the center of my will and I want to use you. And Satan wants to keep you from ever doing that. And so Paul encourages Archippus back to the ministry. Put this down, number three. Request others remember you in prayer. There in verse 18, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Paul dictated the letter, but he would sign it with his own hand. In Galatians, he says, see with what large letters I'm writing. This is me, you know. And then he says, remember my imprisonment. They knew he was in jail. They had sent Epaphras to him. What is Paul saying? Let me tell you what he's not saying. He's not saying, could you please do a GoFundMe account and get an attorney to get me out of here? He's not asking for sympathy. He's not asking for money. He's saying, just don't forget when you pray. I want you to remember that I'm in prison. We are told to remember those who are in prison, especially for the faith, as though we were in prison with them, it says in the book of Hebrews. And here Paul is just saying, I, I just want you guys to know what's really going on in my life. But he's also saying something more, and I want you to catch this. When you ask somebody to pray for you, some of us in this room never do that. We've never done that. We just, we don't do, we, maybe we don't know anybody well enough or maybe we feel like, well, I don't want to bother them or I don't want to bug them. Listen to me. When you ask people to pray for you, you are giving them the privilege of obeying scripture. The Bible says, bear one another's burdens. How can they do that if they don't know what's going on in your life? Maybe you say, well, I've got this problem. I, I feel, I've got this job. I hate it. Remember me and my imprisonment. You know, you, maybe you need to tell somebody that. You know, I, I'm living in this place and it's really hard. Just what, what's going on in your life? But offering and asking someone else to come near to you and be aware. You're humbling yourself by asking for prayer of people. And then finally, resolve that grace will be your bottom line. He closes with the words he opens with. Here four words, grace be with you. Put in the word bottom. It's the bottom line of everything Paul has to say. And he has said this, when we talk to sinners, he said it earlier in the chapter, add grace. Season your words as it were 
with salt, that it might give grace. Now he's talking about the saints. When you, when you talk to the saints or about the saints, add grace, you know. You see, Paul will tell us in 1 Thessalonians, that's our next book we'll study, by the way. Can't wait. It's a great book about Christ coming and living in light of it. But there in 1 Thessalonians, he'll give the command, appreciate those who labor among you. Respect them. Hold them in high esteem. Paul could have given that command here, but he doesn't. Instead of giving a mandate to appreciate spiritual leaders, he just models it. That's what he's doing in those first few verses. He's just telling you about people that were in ministry with him and the impact that they've made on his life. Jot down Psalm 45 and verse 2. This is a prophecy concerning the Messiah. You, Jesus, we would say, are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. And I look around this room. <laughs> I know many of you. I know your stories. And I am so grateful that a lot of you know my story, too. I see men and women who have been around. I have my own errands and my own hers <laughs> who have been here to hold up my hands and pray for this congregation. I have many of you who have walked through the trials that I've walked through in my family and still to this day walk through. I am so grateful for that. And we have some wonderful men on our staff who helped me to do that. Some of you know one or two of them. Let me just briefly tell you who they are. Pastor Maury. Can I get an amen about the blessing he is? Yeah. Humble shepherd who reflects the Lord's heart. In fact, uh, Maury's heart is always breaking for those that are hurting. Always. It's always his prayer request for you guys. And, uh, of course, he's always ready to listen and to love and to help. Pastor Jim Richards, who he and his wife, who are fighting cancer. Linda has terminal cancer, unless God miraculously heals her. They're not only here today serving in the cafe, they'll be here Tuesday because they love you. And uh, he is a hard-working pastor. He's been with us for many, many years. He has a rare gift. <laughs> Bless the Lord. Rare gift of administration. There are a lot of gifted pastors, but not all of us are gifted in that, and he is. Pastor Ozzie, some of you don't know him. He's actually ministering right now in the gymnasium. And he's the one who started, with the Lord's help, the church down in Anaheim, what they call Calvary Chapel El Centro. Ozzie's a servant of servants. Every Tuesday when I come in and pray with the staff before we start our day, I go to my office, and in a few moments, there'll be a knock on my door. It's not Ozzie. It's somebody else with a cup of coffee for me, but it was given to them by Ozzie. Ozzie looks around and says, here, you give it to Pastor Bob today. He, wants, he considers that a privilege. You know, I'm not sure they do, but Ozzie goes, oh, you give it to Pastor Bob. And Ozzie's an evangelist par excellence. See, whenever I travel with him, if we're around any non-Christians, and he loves to be in lines in customs, in airports, on planes. He loves to share with unbelievers, and he'll often turn to me, while he's talking to them, he'll turn to me and say, hey, Pastor Bob, pray for me that I close the deal. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor Ralph, who assists Pastor Ozzie, we had the memorial for his beautiful wife yesterday here, Gail. Yeah. <laughs> Pastor Ralph is content to serve in the shadow of another and help in this case, Ozzy fulfill his calling. He's an unsung hero among us. Pastor Ryan, who does our announcements, and you know him in the college ministry, teacher, counselor, encourager, really always ready, in my opinion, to embrace whatever the Lord has. He's part of our creative leadership team, and he's always, well, let's do that. Let's do that. He's just open to what the Lord wants to do. Pastor Josh Tarada, visionary, <laughs> really is. Uh, kind of a genius, uh, don't tell him. Um, passionately preaches God's word. You remember, he's all over the stage. You go, camera man just gives up. And uh, <laughs> constantly has one passionate prayer, and that's for revival in his day, to see that happen here in Orange County again, and also for the next generation. Pastor Ken uh, Chin, some of you don't know him yet, but you'll get to know him in the, in the days ahead. He just came on this summer. He's been in Korea for the last five years. Uh, Ken's our missions pastor, and he's also involved with Salt Light with more. He has a heart for the lost. He's got a missionary's heart, but God's given him to us to help us with our missionaries and also for making an impact on our, uh, on our own community. And then Pastor Mike uh, uh, Williams, who's also a new pastor. This is the redhead, remember? Um, 
I say of Pastor Mike, he, he, has, a, he has a beautiful mind for the master. He, he has a wisdom, truly very intelligent man, um, working on his doctorate, but uh, not because of that. Really, he thinks extremely deeply about scriptures and has profound insights uh, into them, how they apply to people's lives. So I'm so glad he's part of our staff. And then finally, Pastor Daryl Williams. Some of you know he has a lot of children, in fact, in our, in our, uh, in our worship ministry here at the church. Daryl's assistant to Josh, and so you might not see him as much. We started asking him to do some of the uh, announcements. Daryl is a very soft-spoken and soft-hearted, humble guy, but with deep, I've noticed whenever he opens the scriptures, a profound insight that I've missed or that he's learned somewhere along the way. He's doing a lot of the devotions on the, online and uh, also helping out with, with you. My point is this, God has given us some incredible people, not just us as a congregation, but me personally. And they do, they hold my hands up and I wanna say thank you, Lord. Hey, listen, you guys, we gotta go, but I wanna tell you one thing. I wanna be a man of prayer, so should you. If Christ is in me, he was a man of prayer when he was on this earth. He proclaimed the gospel. If Christ is living in us, we're gonna proclaim the gospel. And Christ encouraged and praised and prized the people around him with gracious words. That's gonna be a reflection that he's living in us when it comes through us. Let's pray. Father, we're ready to go into the week, but we need your help. Lord, we confess to you sometimes, like Isaiah, our confession has to be, I'm a man or I'm a woman of unclean lips. We've gossiped, we've, we've not cared about people. Lord, we've been prideful. Lord, there's all kinds of sins that we commit with our tongue. We need forgiveness, we need cleansing, but we need more. We need you to fill us with your spirit and we need you to give us a heart that out of that abundance we can speak, that people could see Jesus coming out of us because Jesus is living and ruling in us. Lord, would you make that true this day? Would you make us men and women of prayer, men and women of sharing the gospel, and men and women who are willing to publicly prize and praise those that you've used in our life. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. let's stand and sing to the Lord.